Hello everyone. Welcome to Interpret and Tradition. I have been reading books for you. Um, well, I'm still reading them um, on mainly Catholic um, issues um, on the Mass, reading on the Mass, um, and on um, works of mysticism, my own translations. I have also been reading books in Spanish. I thought that today I, I'm i going to start something different. I will continue with these readings um, until I finish them and perhaps I'll start with something else afterwards. But um, I'm going to do something different, try to do something different with you, which is um, my intention at the beginning was to discuss um, literature, the books that influenced me more in my life. I am not a scholar, I just, um, I was a teacher for, a, for quite a while, for over 20 years. Um, mainly I taught um, pre-university students, mainly political philosophy and um, sociology, that kind of thing. I'm retired now, I'm in my 70s, and um, I thought that um, I, I could discuss a few books, a few authors that had a, a great influence on me. I don't know that this will work. Um, I, I am not reading, I, I have hardly prepared my thoughts. But one of the authors that most affected me, most influenced me in my life has been um, Dostoevsky, and I'm not going to discuss the Brothers Karamazov or um, uh, Crime and Punishment because there are many people discussing those and uh, much better than I can. Uh, but uh, I, the first writer that, the first author, Russian author that I read was Gorky. And I think that started my love for Russian literature. I'll tell you how it came about. I was um, a student at university, was, uh, reading politics. And one day with my tutor, this is over 50 years ago, um, he said to me, oh, you come from Spain? And uh, I said, yes, and the usual questions when you are living in a foreign country, well, why did you come here? What are you? <laughs> that sort of thing. But so I started discussing uh, my, we ended up talking about my childhood a little bit. Uh, he found it interesting because I was raised by nuns in Catholic Spain. <laughs> and uh, this was kind of uh, different, uh, strange to him. And he said, by nuns, he said, my goodness, but you, you, you look rather sane to me. <laughs> goodness and uh, and I said uh, yes I, I think I am sane as a matter of fact I think I am one of the sanest people I know I was in my 20s so <laughs> and uh, but we were discussing my childhood with nuns and uh, this was in an orphanage I was raised by by um, the sisters of charity of St. Vincent de Paul and uh, I have nothing bad to say about them at all. I'm eternally, eternally grateful to them. I must be at the moment one of the few people who have something good to say about them, but I, I'm not going to talk about that. But he said to me, my goodness, have you read Gorky? And I said, no, who is he? And he said, oh, he's a Russian author. But because of the background in poverty and so on, he said, oh, you must read him. So I read Gorky and uh, it affected me profoundly. I went back to read, uh, to read him again and uh, it, didn't partic it didn't have that effect that second time. But the first time I read him, I, I thought it was the best book I, I had ever read or I would read in my whole life. Very briefly, um, he wrote Gorky, uh, this is at the end of the 19th century, and he wrote a book 
it's a trilogy. Um, he titled them My, um, My Childhood, My Apprenticeship, and My Universities. He never went to university, it was just the experience of life that he had had. And uh, what I remember about it was that um, he was um, the first memory that he had of his childhood was his mother on the ground and a man, I don't remember whether it was his father or his stepfather now, um, with his foot on her chest. He says, so what I remember is that boot from, from this, this man on his chest. That was one of his first memories of, in life. He was raised by his grandmother and, his, and uh, his grandmother would go out and beg in the streets and he would go with her. And because it was so cold, sometimes he would go into this bookshop just to get warm and pretending that uh, he was still a child, but pretending to look at books and to read them and so on. Of course, there was uh, the, the, the shop owner a very, very kind Jewish man knew what was happening. And so he came over to him one day and said, um, can you read? And he lowered his face and uh, his head and he said, uh, no. And he said, well, I tell you what, I will teach you how to read. You have to come every day at this time and I will teach you how to read. And he did. And he went and he learned how to read. And then the nice gentleman would give him books, you know, all the classics, Treasure Island and all those lovely books. And he explains how those books opened his mind to another world, to a different reality, a reality that he had never experienced. All he had experienced was practically begging in the streets. And he read all this books, as many as he could. Anyway, at the age of 11, um, he got a job on a boat, and uh, his job was to be the assistant to the assistant to the assistant to the cook. <laughs> his job was to peel potatoes all day long. That is what he did. And uh, at night, he says, all the um, seamen would uh, come up on deck and they would um, talk and um, get drunk or whatever uh, but they allowed him to be there with them listening to to their conversation and uh, he started telling them stories all the stories that he had read in books and things and sometimes he would just make it up and just and um, he would just talk and enjoy that being with them and having people listening to his stories and one day something happened that changed his life and that and that is the, that was that uh, one of the uh, seamen there half drunk said to him you know you're very good with words you should become a student at a university and he thought a I mean, at the end of the 19th century, who went to university? I mean, you didn't even think about it, of the possibility. But the idea of being a student at a university, it really had an effect on him. And when they, uh, in the next uh, big city, he said goodbye. And he actually walked all the way to the university this is at the age of 11, and he went there and he said, I'm here to become a student at this university. Well, of course, he, he, never, <laughs> he never became a student at the university, but he did the next best thing, and that was to get a job in a um, um, coffee shop, um, a bakery shop, next, very, very near to the university. And his job was to deliver cakes and bread and biscuits to the students. And he loved that because he would go there and he would hang around the students. And the students, they were all so clever, so intelligent. He thought, oh my goodness, this is the, um, 
they would they would talk about uh, politics and the revolution coming and uh, this is pre nineteen seventeen obviously and uh, and and he thought that they knew so much he loved it. Um, anyway, one of the students was Lenin, by the way. <laughs> anyway, so this is um, uh, Gorky was my first encounter with um, with Russian literature, and. Uh, then I moved on to other authors, and I want to talk to you about Dostoevsky. Um, you know those huge books that he has, Crime and Punishment. I, I, I read it quite a few times, and like any good book, every time you read it, you get something out of it that you didn't see before. Um, this is what happens with books like uh, uh, Cervantes Don Quixote, for example. When when you read it, uh, you know, when you are a young, a teenager, or a child, um, you just laugh because it's a funny book. Okay, when you read it at thirty, um, you don't laugh so much. You begin to see other things. By the time you're seventy and you read it. Uh, it is, it is rather sad, perhaps. Um, you see different things. You know what I'm what I'm talking about. So, uh, with Dostoevsky, what I found was that um, one of the books that impressed me most, actually, is the House of the Dead. The house and and then another short story, but the house of the dead. Uh, I want to talk to you about the house of the dead. Now, Dostoevsky. This is in the eighteen fifties, perhaps. Um, he was a student, uh, you know, talking about I don't know the revolution um, against the Tsar, um, all that sort of thing that young people wanting to change the world. Um, idealistic, <coughs> which is good when you're young. And uh, anyway, uh, he got caught, it's a long story, and uh, he was sentenced to death, and um, just before he was about to get executed, the, uh, the uh, order came from the Tsar to not to execute them, but to send them to Siberia to camp there. So the House of the Dead is basically his own personal experience of being there. Um, and um, one of the things that impressed me most or affected me or influenced me, I don't know what to, uh, how to call it, is um, he, when he went there, he started observing people, started observing the people around them, around him. He knew that he was going to be in a little bit of trouble because he was um, an aristocrat really, or perhaps if not an aristocrat, certainly a member of the what the other criminals considered upper class or upper middle class or something like that. Most of them were uh, illiterate and working men and so on. So he knew that uh, he wasn't going to fit in very well. And instead of trying to um, say to them, oh, you know, I'm like you, I feel your pain, that kind of thing. He said, no, I'm just, I'm, I am who I am. And uh, if they um, are unkind to me or whatever, well, I'll just have to endure it uh, and so on. Eventually, they accepted him, uh, they respected him. He observed the, um, how they spoke, the uh, figures of speech, and he was taking note. He had never heard um, this way of talking, and he was learning. He wasn't at all contemptuous of any of them. He was actually learning. And uh, anyway, he... Um, one of the things that he observed, which 
I think is uh, worth thinking about it was this. The serfs in Russia were freed in 1861. This was happening before then. And um, the punishment, if you misbehave or if you did something in that uh, prison camp, was uh, most of the time was lashes, just, just scourges and lashes, and, you know, 200, 300. There were two ways of doing it. One with... He says stick in the translation. I don't know what a bat or I don't know what it must have been. But the other one, the most painful one, was with the with the uh, the branch a branch of a birch tree, and that was really painful because that cut into the skin. And if they continued doing it, it could be obviously rather painful. The skin broke and and so on. So they would be punished. Um, you know, 100 lashes, 200, 1,000 sometimes. If, it, if the lashes were done with the birch tree, they would stop at a certain point, perhaps 100, 150, and they would stop, and then they would take them to the infirmary and until, you know, for a few days until the, 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 until he healed a little bit, and, um, and then they would go back. And he noticed he was in the infirmary quite a bit himself, and uh, he uh, noticed that uh, the the, um, the the people there, the, the criminals there, when they were punished, they would come back to the infirmary and they would talk about the, uh, among themselves about well how many how many lashes did you get? Oh, I've got two hundred. Oh, really? Well, I only got hundred and fifty. How many have you got left? I still have five hundred and twenty-five left. And they would talk about it normally. That was what was expected and, and, and so on. Uh, he was taking note of that. And um, he noticed something else. The people who were doing the lashes, okay, the, um, they, called, they were called the executioners. And he noticed this at first the executioners would uh, give the lashes, okay, one, two, three, and so on. But he noticed that they knew that they were inflicting pain. They were aware of that. Of course, they continued doing it. It was their job. They had to do it. Otherwise, they would get the lashes themselves. <clears throat> so they, they would do their job, but he, he, he felt that they, they were aware that they were inflicting pain on another human being. Those were the new ones. After that, after a while, he noticed that that sort of inner empathy uh, started disappearing. So the second stage as it were was that there was no empathy at all they would just do the job one two three you know until they got to 200 as a job but they got used to it and then there was a third stage and that was when they felt the power that they had um they wanted the, the, the people, the, the, the criminals, the, the, the prisoners, to be aware of their power. The experienced uh, captives would therefore, when they went, they would throw themselves, at, at, you know, at, at, uh, on their knees, pleading, oh, please, you know, I have a wife and eight kids, and so on and so forth. Of course, they knew that he was going to do his job anyway. He wasn't going to, to be any kinder to them because of that. But they needed this ritual to let him know, oh, I see that you're powerful kind of thing. The rookies, the, 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 the ones who had just uh, arrived, the proud ones, were the ones who said, I'm not going to beg, I'm, no, 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 I'm just going to, you know, just find my teeth. And, and, 
And um, what happened was for the executioners, when they felt that they wouldn't plead and beg, they would go about it much harder. In other words, you acknowledge my power here. And if you don't, you're going to get it, you know, double. So that was kind of the third stage, a, a, a demand almost for recognition of power. And then there was a fourth stage that he noticed. And, and this happened to practically all of them. They went through these stages, all of them. And the fourth stage is, was, that they actually enjoyed inflicting pain. They now got pleasure out of it. Before, in the earlier stage, they wanted the criminals to recognize their power. Now it went beyond that. Now they enjoyed the pleasure of inflicting pain on other people. And he says that this is the most, obviously the most dangerous because when you get pleasure out of it, that is like a drug. You need more and more and more. Um, you're never satisfied. The, the, the pleasure has to increase, just like people who take drugs, they need to take more and more. Um, and so uh, it, it, is, it is never ending. You actually get to that uh, uh, sadism, I suppose. But that happened to practically all of them. They all got to that point. And I thought about this and how it might be, if we can translate this now, forget the 19th century, forget lashes, forget all that. If we can apply it now to today's world, well, no one is lashing anybody. Uh, well, not in our countries anyway. But the stages are there in a different way, but they are there, I think. Um, I have noticed the change. I don't know whether you have noticed it. I don't want to be overly pessimistic or anything like that, but I have noticed the change in our political leaders. When I was young, and certainly even in my middle years, if a politician did some, did something wrong, um, or was caught at any rate, uh, there was a certain um, noblesse oblige that that you had to resign, or there was there was some honor or dignity or shame attached to it. You couldn't just have done something terrible or that society considered not good and uh, and continue on i think that that has disappeared now i i sense almost a contempt no i did that so what what are you going to do about it of course they don't say it but it seems that the sense of dignity is no longer there sense of honor is no longer there. I don't see it. Perhaps you do. I don't. And the sense of shame is not there. It's raw power. And yes, yeah, so what are you going to do about it? The contempt that they feel for the citizens. I, I think this is happening in the West. I don't know about other countries, but that is what I have noticed. Anyway, I don't want this. I don't want to prolong this video uh, too much because I just want to sort of leave it there for you to think about it yourself and, and see what you think. And if you can, perhaps we can enter into a conversation, you can leave comments or something like that. 
this is what I'm going to, to do. I'm going to um, just things that I have read from my authors or from my favorite authors or and just discuss them with you and, and see how we can apply them to today's world and see if we can think about it and uh, learn something from it. Okay, I'm I'm going to leave it there. I, I I don't know how this is how this has turned out, but I I just I just want to talk to you in this in this way and see where we get from here. Okay, thank you again for listening to me. <laughs> bye bye.